I work for a web hosting company called Bluehost. Happy to be here, long time uh, cohort in the, in the Astros project, and uh, just always, always here at AstroCon to have fun and share a little bit about what I know. Yep, so uh, we're gonna kick things off. This is, the title of this talk is Astros for Web Developers, but after a, a lot of discussion this morning, hearing feedback from the past couple of days on what we've been working on, it's really Astros for Modern Developers. Uh, what we've done is uh, we've added a new interface in Astros 12, ARI, the Astros REST interface, and uh, you know it's really geared toward web developers, but I think anyone who uses a web API, which I believe can be pretty much anybody now who is in the development community, will enjoy working with us, and it'll be really good. Uh, we're gonna tag team through here. Here's a quick agenda. Yay, let's just get started. Uh, when we built ARI, the primary motivation we had going into this was we wanted to make it simple to write applications that run on Asterisk. Uh, it, to, to think about sort of the context of where Asterisk is, uh, it helps to go back. I was glad that Mark shared how he got started uh, on Asterisk. Uh, it was first released in December of 1999. Uh, think back for a minute about what the world looked like in 1999. That was a time when we were still worried about Y2K. Uh, in 1999, Google actually changed their logo. I don't know how many of you remember the original Google logo. Oh, man, of all the, they, <laughs> of all the presentation fails. Uh, Google, they had the beta logo in the early part of 99. So, um, which was OK, because for most people, this is what the internet looked like. Uh, this was where you went to go find things was the Yahoo web page, but that was, of course, after you dialed up and connected through your internet service provider. So uh, the whole point of going through this is Asterisk was built in a different time, and over the past several years, Asterisk has grown and changed as the world has grown and changed around it. Asterisk 12, with the, uh, you know, not only the introduction of ARI, but also the enhancements we've made to AMI, CDRs, and CELs, we've really, uh, evolved it. it, this is the next step in Asterisk and sort of in using Asterisk and in building your applications on top of it. So um, ARI it stands for the Asterisk REST interface. Um, now if, if you're familiar with the other interfaces in Asterisk, AMI and AGI, the goal of ARI is not so much to replace AMI and AGI. The goal is to replace app queue. The goal is to replace app voicemail. We want to make it simple for you to build your own applications that, beat your, that meet your own business needs. Um, in 1999, it was great to write a module in C that did some sort of business application. Just out of, out of curiosity, how many people have tried to write an asterisk module in C? Just by a show of hands. How many people loved that experience? <laughs> <laughs> OK. Boy. All right. This Fabulous. is not the talk for you then. <laughs> for, the, for the rest of you, I think this is the talk you're, you're, you're waiting for. Yes, fantastic. It, uh, really, this is taking Asterisk a step forward. Uh, in trying to make Asterisk easy, an easy platform to build applications, uh, we had uh, four primary design goals that I just uh, made up the other day. Uh, we wanted uh, ARI to be accessible to any developer. And really, by making it a web-based interface, I think we can accomplish that. Any programming environment has a great way of accessing web services today. Uh, we wanted to be very practical in the design of the API. Uh, we wanted to uh, be very pragmatic in what we did with it and not get too hung up on uh, you know, being purist about REST versus whatever else. Uh, another key design criteria was that we wanted the API to be well-documented, and it actually, being enforcing good documentation and providing good documentation had an interesting impact on the API design itself, as I think you'll see when we get into demonstrating how you'd use it. And also, we wanted to make the API easy to use, easy to discover, um, and easy to get into. So there's really three parts to ARI. Uh, the first part, which is the most obvious, that's the part that's in the name, is the REST interface. And this is designed as you would expect any modern REST interface to be. You've got a set of resources that are available through a web server. Asterisk itself has a tiny little built-in web application server. And ARI is built and served out of that. And so ARI itself is implemented in C as a set of Asterisk modules. Um, and it, we're, uh, you know, it's, it's a typical modern REST inter RESTful interface where we use the HTTP verbs you would get to, do, to read information in. Um, you would issue posts to 
uh, you know, to create, a new, object to create or... a new object or to change the state of an existing object, and then deletes get rid of objects. And so you would delete a bridge you know, just by saying delete ARI bridges and then the identifier of that bridge. And that bridge will go away or the delete will fail and it will tell you why. So uh, the second part, which is also important, the one thing that a RESTful API does not do well is provide asynchronous information back to you. Um, and there's lots of ways of accomplishing that. For the first version of ARI, we decided to go with a WebSocket. Uh, WebSockets were introduced in the, into the Asterisk web server as a part of Asterisk 11 as our, uh, part of our WebRTC development. It's been a very solid mechanism for uh, distributing asynchronous events from Asterisk back to the, uh, the application. Uh, and most programming environments have a really good WebSocket client library available to you. And for the most part, it, your invocation is going to look something like this, WebSocket.connect. And you pass it the URI of what it is that you want to connect to. When, in the case of uh, ARI, it's going to be the events resource. Um, and you will give it the name of the application that's connecting, that sort of thing. Uh, finally, the thing that brings everything together is the Stasis Dial Plan application. This is what bridges the world between Asterisk Dial Plan traditional application development and ARI. From within the Dial Plan, you execute the Stasis application. It, uh, you can give it the, the first, it's a very similar to AGI, actually, in this case. Uh, the first parameter is the name of the application, and then you have a comma-separated list of parameters that you want to uh, pass to that application. And so to the Stasis app, for example, this is invoking the hello application with a parameter world. And, and, and again, the hello in, in, in that you pass as the first parameter is, met, is going to match up with the name of your app in your WebSocket connection there mm -hmm. in, the, in the second step. Yeah. And that, that is what binds these two worlds together. And, so, and what, what you will see, you, you connect to the WebSocket with the app named Hello. When a channel enters the Stasis application named Hello, you will see an event on the WebSocket that says, oh, Stasis started up on this channel. And you get all the details for that channel. And then you've got the channel ID that you can then use through the REST API to answer the channel, play media to the channel, record media from the channel, put that channel into a bridge, whether it's a mixing bridge where they get to talk to other, uh, where it mixes with other channels, or uh, a holding bridge where they're just receiving music on hold. So, um, Let's see, another thing that I wanted to talk to, I mean, the, it, it may seem a bit odd that you enter the Stasis application in order to send something off to ARI. Stasis is an abstraction that we introduced into Asterisk 12, and it, uh, it's an abstraction we're going to use for coding external APIs um, from now on. And it has done a tremendous job in giving us consistency between our interfaces. If you look at the work we did on improving AMI, uh, AMI is now much more consistent you know, itself, you know, with itself, which is good. Um, but it's also consistent with the messages that you will see coming out of Stasis, at, or coming out of ARI. And that is because they're both built on top of Stasis. And what that also gives us is as the world evolves, as it will continue to, whenever whatever the next thing past REST is, we have a lot less friction in introducing a new interface, a new API to, uh, you know, for, I don't know, Web 3.0. So, Hol hol holographic video. Tips. Yes. You know, whenever we have um, holographic video control over, <laughs> over APIs. Um, if you're familiar with REST in terms of RESTful web APIs, there's really no standard for it. You know, there's no one thing that you can point to and say this is REST other than the original you know, Roy Fielding dissertation, which it, it's kind of hard to parse out you know, what you mean by that. Uh, Martin Fowler and uh, uh, Richardson actually put together an article a few months ago that does a really good job sort of breaking it down in terms of you know, here are the different sorts of REST interfaces that you can run into and sort of breaking them down into four levels. You know, uh, it's a great article. Go read it. Um, ARI, it's, it's firmly in level two. You know, we have HTTP resources that are well-defined. We use the HTTP verbs to, uh, to control those resources. We do not go to the level three of hypermedia controls, which uh, goes into this uh, practice of we valued practicality over purity. Uh, we looked at actually doing hate OAS, if you're familiar with that. It, this is um, hyperlinking as the engine of application state. This is the glory of REST that you saw on the slide prior. Uh, this is where basically your application is a single URL. And you go to that URL, and the response you get back has links 
to everything you can do with the application. And then those links take you to other links, and those links take you to other links, and so on and so forth. It's very much like a website, and that's really the original intent of that. Uh, it's hard to implement, and uh, you know, so I didn't want to do it, obviously, since I was implementing. But the other thing is that um, it does violate a principle for programmatic remote API calls, and that is the best remote API call is the one you don't make. <laughs> and HateOS actually leads you into this pattern of request, response, request, response, request, response, and you find yourself starting from your core URL and digging your way through the API to get to the thing that you really want. Um, instead, we have a centrally documented API, and from there you launch into directly what it is that you want. Uh, let's see, what do I have next? Uh, the other thing we did in, in terms of being practical, today all of the responses out of the API are JSON. Uh, we actually have a plan for implementing XML if anyone cares. I think, I think the, the care threshold on XML is now fairly low. <laughs> but, uh, uh, the, but JSON was a great choice because it is not only a document model, it's also an object model. And so it made it really easy to take uh, the models that we have within Asterisk itself, map it into the messages that we want to send, and to manipulate those messages in a programmatic way, as opposed to XML, which was painful. So, um, let's see. Uh, finally, what I want to talk about is the fact that it's well documented. Uh, if, uh, how many of you remember the early days of AMI when, uh, like Ole was talking about, <laughs> you know, where's the documentation? Well, it's in the code. <laughs> You know, obviously, that is not where we want to be today. Astros is a mature project, and we want to make sure that whatever we have is accessible and accessible to people who are coming at it fresh, who want something new and don't want to go digging into a big pile of C to figure out what this thing actually does. And don't want surprises like, like, yes. like the graphic here <laughs> illustrates. You really don't want to be stabbed in the face by your application, you know. <laughs> so uh, I found a wonderful specification called Swagger. And I will say all manner of wonderful things about it. It is a specification, and it actually is an application toolkit. You can build, you know, they have uh, an application in for, engine for building RESTful applications in Scala. Uh, but you don't have to use Scala. You don't have to use any of that. They also have a standalone specification for describing RESTful APIs. And what I loved about it is that it was simple, it was to the point, and it was flexible enough for us to do most of what we needed to do. We, uh, the, the WebSocket was the one thing where we sort of broke the bounds of RESTful APIs, but that kind of does it itself. Uh, you can see here, this is just a little snippet of the JSON documentation from the Astra source code itself. It's what you would expect. I have a resource. Here's the operations for that resource. For each operation, you get a description. You get the inputs to that, which is, this is a get, there are no inputs, but you also get the response. It uh, has a documented JSON response model, which if you care enough about it, you can actually go in and see, okay, this is what I can expect to get back from this. Um, we use this uh, JSON, we use the Swagger API definition to generate a lot of the boilerplate in Asterisk for actually building the uh, RESTful API itself. That saved me a lot of typing, personally. But uh, it also, we also use it to build a lot of validators. So whatever parameters come in, uh, you know, they get parsed out for me so that I know, if there's no surprise parameter to an application. There's no surprise parameter to an ARI call. You know, I'm not gonna get it in my code unless it was parsed out by the middle layer that gets generated. Uh, I also have validators that run only in development mode that validate my responses. And so if I, send back a response that doesn't match the documentation in developer mode, I get an error. And so that means that you guys have, I, I won't say the documentation is perfect, you know, there's still opportunity to write bad documentation, but it's a lot better than what it had been. And it, it really kind of enforces, enforces the, the, the right thing on the on Well, the I mean, it, what it does, it enforces discipline. Yeah. And developers, um, by definition, are a lazy bunch, and, uh, which is why I did the code generator to generate a lot of this code for me so that I wouldn't have to type so much. But um, if you've got something that forces them to do the right thing, you've got a much better chance of the right thing actually getting done. Um, the next thing, which I think is going to be more applicable to you guys, is that we take the Swagger API definitions and we generate the documentation that we post to the wiki. Go to wiki.asterisk.org, search for asterisk 12 ARI, 
and you will find a list of all of the RESTful API resources that we have, the methods that they support, the uh, details of the parameters for them, the details for the JSON models that are gonna be coming back as responses for that, uh, the details of all the JSON models you can get back through the event WebSocket. Uh, it's static documentation that's just readily available to you from uh, the wiki, and it's, it's a fabulous resource. Go and check that out. What I think is incredible is that it also gives you an interactive API documentation using a project called Swagger UI. And I want to emphasize the fact that this is interactive. I'm going to be demonstrating this in a minute. But not only do you get documentation where it tells you the same thing that you get from the wiki, but it also gives you a form that you can fill parameters in and click a button, and it will execute that API against asterisk. We'll be showing that off in a minute. Um, the other thing that also is phenomenal is that there are uh, a couple of client projects for actually generating client APIs from that API documentation. Uh, there's a, one project called swagger.js, which will do this live. And so from your JavaScript code, you say swagger.connect, I think, and you give it the URL for your J Swagger resources. And it will generate an object more model for you dynamically. And so then you can say ARI equals swagger.connect, ARI.channels.answer, ARI.channels.hangup, you know, and it, it gives you a, a fairly decent API just out of the get-go based off of the API documentation that we're providing for you. So let's see. Uh, next, I'm going to hand it off to Jared. We'll do a quick change up here. So if you'll give us just a second as we, uh, as we swap computers here. Well, I uh, wanted, to, wanted to dive into the kind of the practical, you know, getting started with ARI, um, the configuration, and just a couple of quick examples so that we can dive from the theoretical that you've just seen into really being able to use this in, uh, in a more practical mode. Switch my display here. Let's see if that works. Can you see that? Okay, so first let's talk about the configuration. If we go into the, uh, into the configuration uh, directory for Astros 12, um, the first thing you want to do is go into http.conf. Uh, again, this is where you configure the built-in web server within Asterisk. Uh, the, the most important things here you need to set up are make sure that the, the, the web server is enabled. Um, you can also set uh, the, the, the address that it listens on. In this case, it's only listening on localhost, and you can say which, which H, HTTP port is it going to use. In this case, the default is 8088. Save that, and you're done with that part. The other, the other piece of the configuration is the configuration for ARI itself. Again, a very simple configuration file. Um, you want to enable it. Say enabled equals yes. Um, right now, I've got uh, pretty printing turned on, meaning when it prints out a JSON object, it's going it, it, to look great in your browser. You're going to be able to see how that looks. You can turn that off and get a more compact um, you know, JSON object if, if, if you'd like. Um, um, here we set the uh, allowed origins. This is so you don't worry about uh, you know, cross-origin uh, problems if you, if you have one, you know, a website with a different URL or a different domain trying to access uh, these resources. A little unsafe to just set it to star, but for, for the demo here, I'll, I'll set it to star and, uh, and that'll work. Um, you can also set an authentication realm um, if, if you want to. I'm, I'm going to ignore that for right now. This next section here is where I create a, a, an ARI user. I put the username in square brackets. I say that what type of, of object is it? Well, it's a user object. I can set it whether or not it's read only. If, it, if it's read only, then, then, then I can read requests. I can't create new objects, that sort of thing. Um, if I set that to yes, then, then you know, it's, it's, you know, if it's a read request, they're going to authentic have to authenticate. Um, I have to set a password for authentication purposes. In this case, my password is very, very secure. It's the word password. And then one last setting here, we need the, the password format. Um, in this case, I'm saying that the password for, format is plain. If we wanted to, we could also have a hashed uh, version of the password in there so that we didn't have our password in plain text in the, in the configuration file. And that's all there is to the config. Not too difficult, is it? Now, um, just to test from the asterisk side of things, make sure things are really working the way you expect them to, you can go to the, to the asterisk command line interface. You can oops, type HTTP show status, and you'll see 
that you have this ARI resource there. And you can also do ARI show status. And you'll notice that it's enabled. And we have user count of one. We can also do ARI show users. And you'll see I have a username of username. And it's not read only. So at that point, you know, I think, I think Asterisk is ready to, to, for us to make a connection. Let's actually go out and make a connection. So let's just uh, really, really quickly just show a, a, one quick example, and then I'll let David do more examples on, on, on itself. But if, if we go to the local web server inside of Asterisk, we go to port 88 slash, 8088 slash ARI. Here's one of the, the, the things we can call slash Asterisk slash info. That's going to give us information about our, our Asterisk installation. Here's our JSON object that came back. It works, woohoo. Okay, so we get to this point and we ask ourselves, uh, okay, but what, what are the resources I can use? What can I actually do with, with ARI? Well, as, uh, as David explained in the, uh, in the asterisk wiki, we've gone through and we've documented the, the various APIs for the various objects. We have this asterisk object that I just uh, showed a little bit of an example from, bridges, channels, endpoints, events, recordings, playback, sounds, and applications. We'll go through these really quickly because we, we don't have a whole lot of time. But if you click on any of these, for example, the asterisk API, you're going to say you can get slash asterisk slash info to get information about your asterisk system. There's get slash asterisk variable to get the variable, the value of a global variable in asterisk. Or you can post to asterisk variable to, to set the value for a global variable on the system. Um, with bridges, um, we can get slash bridges to get a list of the bridges, or we can post to slash bridges to create a new bridge. Um, or you can get details on a, on a particular bridge by getting slash bridges slash in the bridge identifier. We can shut down a bridge by, by using the delete method on, on, on that same uh, URI. We can also add channels, remove channels, start music on hold, stop music on hold, play, or start recording on a, on a particular bridge. Pretty straightforward, right? Um, the channels uh, object uh, works on, on individual channels. Again, you get slash channels to get a list of all the channels, or post to slash channels to create a new channel. Um, or we can get information on a particular channel, hang up or you know, delete a particular channel. Um, then we can do things like dial a channel, continue on in the dial plan past, past our current application, answer a channel, mute a channel, unmute, hold, unhold. Um, you know, start playing music on hold, stop playing music on hold, all these, all these different functions on a particular channel. Okay. Endpoints is dealing with, uh, with the endpoints within asterisk. In asterisk 12, endpoints are what you would, would have thought of of users, peers, and friends in the, in the old SIP model within asterisk. So you say, hey, I want to get a list of all the, all, all, all the SIP devices, for example, connected to asterisk, all the endpoints. Or I want to get the endpoints of a particular technology, whether they're SIP or DOTI or or, or you know, whatever the eeks, whatever, the, whatever your channel driver might be. Um, you can also get details of a particular endpoint by you know, getting slash endpoints, slash technology, slash, and then the name of the, that particular resource. Um, again, we're short on time here. I won't go through all these. Um, events is where, we, we, where you make your WebSocket connection to be able to receive the events that are happening on the, on the Stasis bus. Um, the recordings object, um, obviously, for getting a list of stored recordings, creating a new recording, um, pausing a recording, unpausing a recording, um, th those sorts of events, muting and unmuting a recording. Playback um, is for playing back sounds or, or getting, you know, controlling a particular playback that's in progress. Um, sounds is where you can, can actually go in and see what's the list of sounds that are on the system right now. Um, now I'll get back a particular you know, information about a particular sound so that you can use that on the channel, for example, to play that sound to a, to a channel. And last but not least, we have our applications um, object. This is where you, you go out and look at, these are the various you know, ARI applications that, are, that have connected to the WebSocket that are listening um, for the connection. So again, I, I ran through those fairly quick because of the time constraint here, but I think that gives you a, re a really good idea. of these are, the, these are the objects that exist in ARI today. This is what you can do with that. Um, there will obviously be more coming down the road as we get uh, more time for David here. All right, so the last thing we want to finish up with is just a very brief 
demo of some of the things that you can do. This will be fun. OK. No idea. Right. It is completely. OK, so I'm going to start asterisk here. There we go. Uh, this is Swagger UI. I actually have it just on my local file system because I don't trust the Wi-Fi here, um, especially for a demo. Uh, you type in the URL for ARI. Um, the, the main entry point is going to be ARI slash API doc slash resources dot JSON, where it's got an entry here for the API key that it's going to be the username colon password from the ARI config that Jared showed you earlier. So if you're using that config I showed before, it would be username colon password there. Yes. So um, all right, we'll just go back and forth. Uh, once again, this, uh, to show you what Jared showed you earlier, this gives you the details of what you can expect back from the API. And click the button, and you get the response back. So you can actually try it out there live, really hitting the ARI interface, see the different methods that you can call, see what the, the various parameters are, see which ones are required, those sorts of things. So let's do something. I will. Um, so I will use a little program called WSCAT. It's a Node.js program that is basically a netcat for WebSockets. I'll use that to connect to the CON13 application. And it, I have a extension 7000 here tied to CON13. So if I can grab that and bring it onto the display, I dial. You can see here's the stasis start event that comes in on the WebSocket saying, oh, here's something. Let's go into the answer. If we go back to blank, we can see he's still connecting. Try out the answer. We get back a 204. That's a no content. That basically means, yeah, it worked. And I don't have anything else to tell you about it. We get back, and now we're connected. And let's do something that's really simple. Let's just play a sound. Once again, we've got the ID for the channel, uh, sound colon, hello world, and Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. I wonder. And it worked five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Promise it did. Let's try something else. So this, this is a, just a really simple application that I put together using uh, Scala and Lyft, if you're familiar with those in web development, that uh, uses ARI. It's sort of a simple control application. Let's see. And Blink is not giving me audio. That is embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, I'll try restarting Blink. Pardon us for the technical difficulties. So anyways, while Blink is restarting, uh, just you can see down here, it, it just puts up a simple log. Blue are the ARI requests that are going in through the RESTful API. Green are the events that are coming back over the WebSocket. Um, Nothing. Well, I don't know. This is the only other thing that was. 
and it's still silent. Well, Phooey, I wonder Well, that's really strange. That is very strange. I will totally go off script and try one more thing. Nope, total fail. Oh, well. um, if you can imagine that you're hearing Allison talking right now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when I clicked answer, that just did an HTTP post to, this is the one, did an HTTP post, which came back with a response 204, no content. We got, um, we got the channel state changing here that says, okay, the channel is now, you know, channel state change. If you look at the state here, the channel is now up. Um, when we did a post to play the sound, we said media sound colon demo congrats. You can also play recordings. You would say recording colon the name of the recording that you gave when you created the recording. Uh, this gives you an ID that is associated with that sound. Uh, let's play another one. And then for the sound, you can pause, unpause. You can restart the playback. You can stop it. And then for all of those, you will get state updates that say, um, oh, they, here's the delete. Here's the playback change saying that playback was done. Um, you can also create bridges through the ARI um, API. So I just created a holding bridge. Uh, you can take any channel and just sort of drop it into the holding bridge. And the holding bridge is going to be playing music on hold while the bridge is up. Then uh, as you, uh, you can play media into the bridge. For a holding bridge, it will suspend the music on hold and it'll play media to all the participants. Or you can actually play media to a channel while it's in a bridge. And it will, you can, so if you have individualized, you know, the, you're, you know, you've been waiting for this long, your estimated, you know, your estimated response time is five minutes. You can play that individually to a channel without taking it out of the bridge or doing anything weird like that. You just play it to the channel, and it will uh, handle that appropriately based on its state. So um, apologize for the sound problem there. Um, and yeah. There we go. Uh, I believe that is um, all the time that we have. Apologize for that. Um, here are a handful of links. I'll put this back up when I'm done uh, for uh, the API documentation on the wiki. Uh, really, just wiki.astros.org. Search that for Swagger. Um, there are great resources out there. You can go look that up. Both um, Swagger.js, which is for uh, using Swagger itself from JavaScript, but also Swagger Code Gen, where you can uh, write templates in Mustache and it will generate code for you or documentation or whatever you want to do from. And then the demo that completely failed me just now, you can find that up on GitHub too. Um, we got a few minutes. I'm sure Russ doesn't mind if I invade his time. So uh, any questions? Yes. Here we go. Over here. Hmm? Well, if you... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe, I don't know. It's embarrassing. Yeah, something about AirPlay popped up on your system. Yeah, AirPlay, which I've never used, so totally embarrassing. Yeah. Ah. 
There we go. Why not? We got time, right? <laughs> Let's see. Answer that channel. Get rid of that one. Congratulations. There we go. There you we have go. successfully installed and executed Much the better. Thanks, Enrique. open source PBX. You have also installed open source PBX. Congratulations. Yeah. You have enough of that. So the other um, part of that. Yeah. Thank you. Go away. There we go. So we'll bring up another channel, answer that. Let's put both of these into the holding bridge. Um, and as you can see, as I'm doing this, you're getting channel enter bridge events, letting you know that channels have actually gone into the bridge that uh, contain the state of the bridge. So this last one, you can see it's got uh, a, the list of the channel IDs that are in that bridge. Uh, here, and then here's the post response for uh, ARI bridges, the ID for the bridge, add channel, channel equal ID. Um, let's see, which one is this one? This is the other. So that'll start a playback here. There we go. So you can, this guy's still getting music on hold. And configuration this files that should chance. help you. That playback. Like a normal PBX, you will navigate this demo. Stop that. Congratulations. We can play you have successfully installed and the executed the Asterisk open source PBX. So. You have all There we go. So we are past end of time. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, the sounds object and how you handle multiple languages there. When you when you when you pull up the sounds API um, or, and, and David will pull it up here. You can actually specify, hey, I want these sounds in just these formats or just these languages. You can filter the sounds and say, I want this sound in this language in this format. It's our, our already set up to handle that. If, if, if you don't want to ask your question now, we'll be around the rest of the conference. Mm -hmm. Feel free to stop by and say hi and, uh, and ask questions. We'll try to help you out.